Um, thank you all tonight coming for Lyle's presentation. Before I be begin, I want to give a shout out. We do have Sekuliak, the research vessel Sekuliak, right there, on the, the, in the port of Nome tonight. They have just returned from the north. Um, that was a cruise led by Craig Lee doing some research with equipment um, for the uh, University of Washington Applied Physics Lab and uh, Office of Naval Research. And I want to mention that tonight we've got we've got Lyle. He's going to talk about the bottom trawl survey, and he's got we've got kind of a one-two punch here because next Thursday night we will have Noah's Jim Murphy, who is the lead for the surface trawl survey in the northern Bering Sea. So tonight we'll hear a lot about the bottom trawl effort, and next week we'll hear about the surface trawl effort. After those two, know that Sekuliak here in Nome tonight is going to turn around. They're picking up a, unexpectedly with very short notice. There's a second cruise that the there's, we thought Sekuliak was going home. So did really everyone on it, but they're headed back north. And that's going to be an effort that is uh, kind of a redo. We did have a straight science in August with Catherine Perchalk talking about the cruise that was going to be led by Phyllis Stabenow and Jackie Grebmeyer. That cruise is now going to happen. They had some unfortunate circumstances that delayed things or um, they had to come home a little early. So they are um, going to be, Seth Danielson and Jackie Grebmeyer are going to be picking it up and taking the ship up north. That information is kind of new to us and it's an unusual time to be heading north in November. So we're really excited that they are going to do a straight science of their results uh, later after Jim Murphy. And I think that night is December 2nd, but we will let you know when that's uh, finalized. So. Um, given that, with that, um, Lyle is the, the research biologist for the race division, but very excitedly for all of us here, he's the new division director as well for the race division. So with that, Lyle, I think I've given you enough and I need to check on my own computer and take it away. We are all extremely interested to learn what did you find on the Northern Bering Sea Bottom Trawl Survey? Tell us what hey, will Gay. happen next. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Gay. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, and as she mentioned, uh, it's been a it's been an interesting summer, I think, for everyone. Um, you know, with COVID, trying to work during a pandemic, this has been pretty dynamic for us, um, but we were able to successfully do our bottom trawl surveys. And albeit we we're running a little bit late from our normal schedule, uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, but we still miss being able to come out to the communities, like be able to talk in person and work with people. And um, kind of trying to get into the mode of that, because this is the first time I'll have given one of these straight sciences when I wasn't actually in Nome and meeting with the people I was trying to find a way and I actually found my Northwest campus uh, ball cap. So I thought I'd put that on for this. So at least it's as close as I can get if I have to do this from the basement of my house. So for our 2021 bottom trawl survey is kind of what did we find? And on this title slide, one of the things I wanted to point out right away is uh, there's been a lot of people involved in this effort working nights and weekends and everything to try to get this data together to share with you and to make a community report. Uh, which is what this picture is on the, uh, the side of the slide. Uh, we will be sending this out um, very soon to the communities. Um, and because uh, this actually got finished up today, that's kind of where we are. This is all kind of hot off the presses material. And I really wanted to, to give a shout out to all the folks uh, from my, my team that's been very involved in this. Um, I started out with what you see on the title side where I made their font bigger than mine. They are more important than I am on this work. And then, then I realized I don't think that's enough. So just to give you a little introduction to a lot of the new team members for the Bering Sea um, Bottom Trawl Survey Group that put lots of time into this report. There's Emily Markowitz, Liz Dawson, Nicole Charrier, John Richard from our Kodiak Lab, Sean Rohan, Bianca, uh, Prohaska, uh, Rebecca Hain, and Dwayne Stevenson. Um, I know everyone really wants to get back to where we're in Nome and can do these in person. And I know all of these individuals are looking forward to talking with the communities and getting to know everything that you know about essentially your backyard, which we are trying to study and monitor. 
With that said, um, just as a kind of a quick talk outline, kind of what I was going to do is give you a little overview of kind of our surveys that are in, in the area, um, the vessels we use, uh, our survey gear, and then some of the results. So our results are not just about the fish, but also we collect a lot of environmental data, in particular uh, water temperature, and we actually track the cold pool. Um, in terms of the fish and crabs and other animals that associate near the bottom, I'll give you some information on their abundance and their size as they've changed. And then um, kind of point out some what we call special projects that I think are of interest to the area and communities in the area have, have helped us with. Things like doing satellite tagging on Pacific cod, um, fish stress and condition work that we have going on. And then also one that seems to have dropped off the bottom of the slide, but uh, work that we're doing on um, collecting samples for monitoring HABs, which I know is of a keen interest to the region. And you guys just had a rather alarming talk here fairly recently on, on HABs issues in the area, harmful algal blooms. So one of the early questions people usually ask is this idea that there's concern, of, you know, like why are we doing these surveys? And it's really about trying to uh, monitor and assess the entire marine ecosystem of Alaska. Um, and in particular, our Northern Bering Sea work came about um, essentially as a reestablishment of historical surveys uh, that were in the region that were of growing concern regarding the loss of seasonal sea ice. And with that loss of seasonal sea ice, there's real concerns about how the ecosystem will respond. So while this work goes into focusing really on the animals uh, from my survey on the bottom, so you know, kind of the lower half of this, as Gay just mentioned, um, another critical component of this same loss of sea ice research is Jim Murphy, and he'll be talking next week, and he does the, the surface and midwater trawl surveys, which will focus a lot more on forage fishes, um, which our data that I can present today is limited on, as well as um, uh, young salmon is, are real key parts of his uh, uh, program's research. So please stay tuned and listen to Jim next week. I know I'll be tuning in because it's a big part of this picture. So beyond the kind of the ecosystem monitoring aspect and, and concerns about loss of sea ice, our data also gets used for a lot of other things, including in your region. Um, it helps to inform for uh, understanding populations for even the commercial uh, and subsistence fisheries and, and hunts that happen in your region. You know, everything from you know, the halibut longline fishery um, to, uh, you know, we collect a lot of data uh, on uh, king crab and Norton Sound. And um, it, it helps to inform the communities a lot about what's going on in your neighborhood. Also, I really view this as an opportunity for us to share knowledge. And this has been incredibly powerful for my group to, to use our survey and our data to open dialogues, to talk with a lot of the communities in the region you know, we come up, do some snapshot of work in the summer. You live there year round and have a much more holistic picture of what's going on and help us to inform our data sets in immeasurable ways. And it's led to a lot of really great collaborative work here in recent years, including I mentioned earlier, some of the um, uh, Pacific Cod satellite tagging work we've done with um, uh, the village of Savunga. All right, so the bottom trawl surveys. We have two primary surveys that uh, we do as often as we can now. One is what we call the EBS or Eastern Bering Sea. That survey is this area right down here. It's 376 station, it's to the south of you. And we've done that survey annually using the same methodology since 1982. The one exception there is all of our surveys uh, were canceled in 2020. So annually with the exception of 2020. The Northern Bering Sea region had intermittent work that happened um, uh, a little bit in the early 90s and prior, but really did not follow the same standardized methods as what we use in the Eastern Bering Sea until 2010. And again, this was all in response to the loss of sea ice. So we did a full survey in 2010, one in 2017, a partial kind of rapid response survey due to um, extreme warming in 2018, then 2019 and 2021 this year. So this talk is predominantly going to focus on this region right here, what we call the Northern Bering Sea. Nome is there, St. Lawrence Island. It's roughly 144 stations. Each 
of these little dots is a station where we go and collect a sample. And they're about 20 nautical miles apart. And we uh, use a very small bottom trawl, what we call a scientific bottom trawl. And we do a short tow at each of those locations. We collect 144 toes in the Northern Bering Sea region. Just for context, I'll provide images and whatnot of the Eastern Bering Sea area, but most of the data and what the focus is this talk is on the Northern Bering Sea. Again, the goals of this is really for monitoring. So we're looking at the movement patterns of fish and crabs and other invertebrates um, that live near or on the bottom. We wanna look at population size and structure, age, genetics um, for very important species. We also collect food web data. So we look at the stomachs and what everything is eating and how it interrelates. And we collect environmental data, water temperature, salinity, light. And again, most of this has been driven by concerns about the loss of seasonal sea ice. For those of you in the region, you probably are starting to become familiar with these two vessels. These are the two vessels that we charter to do this work. Um, these are commercial bottom trawl vessels that we charter to do scientific research in the summers. The, um, the fishing vessel Vester Allen and the fishing vessel Alaska Knight. We do this because, you know, essentially our mission at the Alaska Fishery Science Center is pretty large and NOAA really only has one ship. We're working in the waters of Alaska, the Oscar Dyson. So in order to, to expand our abilities and to do a lot of the work we do, we use chartered vessels. So when you see these two vessels in the Northern Bering Sea, they're not actually up there commercially fishing. There, you'll see signs on them um, that they are actually conducting research with us. And for a quick reminder, this is um, kind of a schematic or a drawing of what our net looks like. Um, this is the trawl that we use. It's called an 83112 Eastern Bottom Trawl. It's a survey, a, a research trawl that um, uh, the foot rope is 112 feet long. The head rope is 83 feet long. It fishes at a width of about 50 feet. And we tow this on the bottom for about 30 minutes. And that's what we use to collect uh, to collect a sample. Um, the net height, how high it opens, is about between six and eight feet on average. So, you know, if you stand up, you know, your average height person and kind of put your hand up, that's pretty much how, how high we fish off bottom. Um, this net also really doesn't have anything in the way of what you would consider to be a foot rope or ground gear. It's just a, a bare wire that's wrapped with a little bit of um, hose to protect it. And the whole point is, is for it to be close to the bottom, um, but basically skim right across the surface to, to try to avoid doing any damage. We wanna just skim the surface and collect as, uh, the samples of things that live right on the surface of the sediment. Um, it's also really similar in size and um, type of trawl to the one that ADF and G uses for their Norton Sound Red King Crab Survey. So you may have seen it uh, referred to for that work as well. Or, and that net is actually um, the predecessor to this net. Uh, we used to use the same net for a number of years. Okay, so going back to those of you that tuned in last week and heard Rick Toman's talk, he threw this image up and I thought this might be a really good spot to start. And because we're getting into kind of our data and while we're out on the survey, one of the things that we try to do to get data out to communities and um, other interests as quickly as possible is as the survey progresses, we post um, preliminary uh, temperature data, primarily for near the seafloor, what we call a bottom temperature. So each of these grid cells you see here is one of the cells where we sample during the survey. And what we would do is basically every day after we would finish our operations, we would via satellite upload data uh, to a website that gets posted on the NOAA website showing kind of what the relative bottom temperature was in that cell. And uh, Rick showed that uh, and talked about this last week. Once we get back to the office, this is essentially what comes out of that and what looks to be the kind of more processed data. And so after doing a bunch of fitting and smoothing, you end up with a data product that looks like this. So on the left side here, we have the near surface water temperatures for 2021 and on the right is the near the seafloor, what we would call a bottom temperature. And uh, the scales are here at the bottom. So in 2021, it was a little bit cooler than what we've seen in most recent years. Um, we have water masses here, you know, this kind of yellow 
it's like seven degrees C, six degrees C through this region. When we refer to the, um, the cold pool, this is a, um, something that comes up a lot and is of particular interest now. Uh, the cold pool is water that's two degrees C or colder. So that's basically about 36 degrees Fahrenheit down to uh, 32 degrees, right? It kind of freezing. That is outlined by this kind of dark blue and black area. Those two areas combined is what we would consider to be the cold pool. The cold pool is um, essentially the uh, remnant of seasonal sea ice from the previous winter. So essentially the the duration, quality, and overall extent of winter sea ice decides or establishes the size and extent of the cold pool. We had a little bit more ice in the 2020 to 2021 winter than what we've had in the last couple of years, but effectively it still did not create much of a cold pool. And this matters to us because especially this zero degree water, this water that's in this black color right here, is effectively a physiological barrier to what we would call subarctic fishes. So things like pollock and cod and uh, northern rock sole, uh, they prefer to not be in water that cold. It isn't that they can't withstand it, but they prefer to not be. And so in years when there's really good ice extent, really good duration and quality to that ice, this cold pool can extend all the way down through essentially the center of the Eastern Bering Sea, and it can even touch the Alaska Peninsula. Um, that effectively structures a lot of the community of fishes and invertebrates that we see in be, between the uh, Southeastern Bering Sea and essentially the Northern Bering Sea. It establishes a um, kind of a barrier that historically made the Northern Bering Sea very Arctic in its profile, whereas south of that barrier was a much more temperate um, or subarctic uh, community structure. And as you can see here, when I use the word barrier, and you look at this little dark area here that's just kind of south and west of St. Lawrence Island, this is effectively not much of a barrier. To give this a little bit of a historical perspective, like I said, we have done full extent Northern Bering Sea surveys um, in 2010, 17, 19, and 21. And I got a little star here so you can keep track of where Nome is. Um, 2010 was effectively what we classify as a cold year. And you can see that dark blue and black area, that cold pool extended all the way down to the Alaska Peninsula. And so you have this kind of large hockey stick that goes from the US-Russia transboundary line um, you know, just south of St. Lawrence Island, past St. Matthew, past the Pribilof Islands, and heads towards the Alaska Peninsula, and it's effectively a little bit into Bristol Bay. With warming in 2017, we see that area start to become more restricted. In 2019, it is virtually gone. And in 2021, we're slightly bigger than we were in 2019 in terms of a cold pool. Surface temperatures during that same four-year um, survey periods, you can see similar patterns here. In 2010, at the surface, effectively, uh, kind of the southeastern Bering Sea and particularly the Bristol Bay sections of it were actually quite cool with temperatures down at around two degrees C or colder, even at the surface. So kind of effectively cold pool water, even on the surface much more warming in 2017, even more so in 2019, slightly cooler than what we've seen since 2017 in 2021, but it's still what we would consider to be in a warm year or a warm phase. So looking at essentially the Eastern Bering Sea, so that, that area south, we have a longer time series there, and that's what this figure is on the left. When we look at temperatures, one of the patterns that we're starting to see is that in the early years of the survey, going all the way back to 1982, was is it used to just kind of vary around the mean. So one year would be a little bit cooler than average, next year it's a little bit warmer. But as we've gotten, um, time has gone on, we're starting to see stanzas develop, essentially periods where consistently were cooler than average, and then we go warmer than average, and then cooler than average for longer and longer uh, uh, periods of time. 
And 2021 is proving to be a little bit interesting right now. And I think we're all very, very keen to find out what happens in 2022, because at this moment, we've been in a very long stanza for, um, for warming, but we dropped down a little bit, both not only on the bottom temperatures, but on the surface temperatures. And I think there's a kind of a hope is, is maybe we are going to see us go into a cold stanza for a while and start to cool down the southeastern Bering Sea. But this might also be just a little bit of variation and jump back up. Next year is going to tell us a whole lot about what's happening. Uh, you'll also notice that the line is broken. The reason why this line is broken is, again, because we did not sample in 2020. The northern Bering Sea you can see the patterns here, it's a little tougher to follow and there's only dots, there's no lines because we don't have consecutive years of sampling that have happened here. But at least in the case of 2020, we're right on our long-term average, which there's really only four data points. And uh, at least at surface temperatures, it was a little cooler than average. So that cold pool area, one of the things that we really are interested in wanting to know is what is the the, the total extent of that cold pool area and the, the, um, the potential for it to serve as a barrier. So we actually track this as an index now. And um, actually Sean Rohan and um, Lewis Barnett from the Alaska Fisheries Science Center have created a new algorithm for doing this in a very consistent way. Um, and some of this, this is what some of their output looks like, which is really quite uh, useful and very fascinating. But the cold pool can actually vary greatly over the, the time series of the survey. And in fact, if you look at a year like 1999, this was the largest cold pool extent that we've ever seen. And it was um, right on the neighborhood of about 112,000 square nautical miles, roughly 80% of the southeastern Bering Sea survey area as a whole was under cold pool conditions. Conversely, the smallest that we've seen was in 2018, when it was only 1,800 square miles, less than 2% of uh, the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf was under cold pool area. Now, again, there's a break here because we didn't sample in 2020, but you can see our data points for 2021 show up there. In 2021, it's still very low, but a little higher than it's been in the recent years with it being about 17,000 square nautical miles or about 12% of the Eastern Bering Sea area. All right, so just a few kind of uh, Northern Bering Sea results by the numbers to give you an idea of what we end up doing the survey. Like I said, if you remember back to that map, there was 144 dots or stations that we sample in the Northern Bering Sea. We would manage to complete all of those stations this year, 100% coverage. And really, I want to give thanks out to the Bering Strait communities for this for kind of two big reasons. Uh, one is, is for uh, working with us and, and talking with us about um, uh, prior to our survey operations to make sure that we could do this uh, in a way that was uh, worked for the communities and that, you know, we made sure that there wasn't any conflicts with hunts or any other things that are going on. And then even also in a practical way for us, as we've talked with communities, there's been spots where we have uh, historically not found good space uh, spots to sample. We've actually increased to where we're now doing 100% of our stations in part because of talking with the communities and using that local knowledge that's been provided to us to, to direct us towards uh, locations where we could successfully collect samples. So I thank you very much for that. It's been instrumental in us being able to do a successful survey, the interaction that we have with the communities. Um, beyond that, so we actually linked over 48,000 fish uh, from 21 different species. Uh, we also did over 19,000 carapace measurements from three species of crab. We collected over 2,400 otoliths or ear bones from eight species of fish. This is a, um, a structure that's used for determining their age. And it also can be used for a number of different things based on isotopes for determining kind of movement and overall health of the population. Uh, we also collected the stomachs from four key species of fish. All right, so we can just jump into some of the data here and um, we'll, we'll start out with some of the crabs. So snow crab populations. I'm sure people have seen the news and know that this is a big interest and concern right now in the southeastern Bering Sea. Um, our estimates of snow crab populations have declined precipitously from the 20, 
2019 survey to the 2021 survey. Um, we saw a similar trend in the northern Bering Sea, but not quite to the same dynamic extent. Um, on the left side of this figure here, you can see the length frequency or basically carapace width frequency of what we sampled in the population. And for the most part, the, the crabs that we saw when compared to the previous years are maybe slightly smaller on average, but not in a grand way, but the number of crab we we're seeing is very low. And on the right is a distribution plot. So those kind of darker colors are where there was larger uh, or greater numbers when we sampled than in stations that had fewer. And basically what you see is there was a low level, um, kind of consistent level of, sam of, of distribution over the entire, not only Eastern Bering Sea shelf, but also in the Northern Bering Sea. So we didn't really see large pocket population in uh, 2021. And of course, there's a little thermometer here to remind you that we're kind of classifying this as a warm year. So if we look at over these four years of complete surveys in the Northern Bering Sea, 2010 being a cold year, and then the other three being warmer, and we look at what we call a biomass estimate. So a biomass estimate, just to kind of refresh memories here, is essentially we take all these small samples that we collect across the entire region and based on the weights and numbers from those, we make an estimate of what we think like the total weight for that species is in an entire region. So for the Northern Bering Sea in 2010, that number was uh, about 319,000 metric tons in the Northern Bering Sea region. So that's just you know like this area right up here. That was our cold year. Um, estimate of like the total weight if we it's just an estimate but if we could have weighed all of the snow crab that's roughly what our data would say it should be and since that year as conditions have warmed that number has declined in the northern Bering Sea it dropped 29 percent in 2017 to 225,000 it dropped 159,000 another 29 percent in 2019 and to 2021 it dropped 54 percent in the um, Eastern Bering Sea Shelf, this region to the south of you that we've sampled since uh, 1982, that number went from 440,000, it dropped 7% to 410, came back up 7% to 439. This year it dropped 75% in the Southeastern Bering Sea to 110,000 metric tons. Red King Crab. So in the Northern Bering Sea, this is kind of an interesting one. And I'm, I, I'm becoming very interested in this data set and what it potentially means. Um, we're not seeing a large number of crab, but when you look at this length frequency plot, one of the things I want to point out to you here, here is that we may be actually able to cohort track. So essentially this large number of very small young crab that we saw in 2017, um, which, this is starting to get down to where to sizes that are pretty small and hard for our net to actually sample. That may be this in 2019, the same population just becoming a little bit older and then in 2021 older yet. So I think we're actually seeing a cohort track through the population that's growing up. Um, that's a great thing to see. Um, the one part of this that's a little bit concerning is at least in our survey data, we're not seeing the same young crab that we saw before. So it doesn't look like that we're, we're seeing any more recruitment events since 2017, but it looks like we're tracking one move through. And at least for the Northern Bering Sea, this is no surprise to the people who are local there, but the uh, Red King crab that we're seeing are pretty localized in uh, the Norton Sound area, but they do extend out to almost to the eastern side of St. Lawrence Island. When we look at that same kind of historical time series, we're not seeing huge changes in the distribution in the northern Bering Sea in the plots up here, but if we look at these biomass estimates, you will see that um, at least in the last two years of the survey, there's been a steady decline of about 29 to 26 percent there, and I think that's mostly those crab that we saw smaller in 2017 growing up. And in the southeastern Bering Sea, there was a small increase, about 11%, after years of declines. So blue king crab. Uh, 
this doesn't have as good of a promising picture, but, you know, with it being able to kind of track a cohort coming up. As you can see, just looking at the length frequency, this number here, this is how many animals we actually measured as part of our sample for the entire region. So in 2010, we actually caught and measured 122 crab. In 2017, it was 248. In 2019, it dropped to 59. In 2021, it's a little higher at 66. But it's a pretty low level that we're seeing and they're pretty well distributed. There's not really much that we can see here. And as we've seen in the past, the population uh, that we see in our samples is kind of around St. Lawrence Island and then north towards the Bering Strait. And again, other than in 2017, when we actually had a couple of really good catches just north of St. Lawrence Island, that led to this really large increase other than that, they've been pretty low and, and actually we've dropped below the uh, biomass estimates that we had in 2010. So we had about 2000 metric tons in 2010, now we're down around 1000 metric tons. So about a 50% decline from 2010, but between 2019 and 2021, there's about a 12% decline. All right, Pacific Cod. I know these have gotten a lot of interest and concern in the region because the numbers went from very few in 2010 during that cold regime to large numbers of very large Pacific cod in the region in the most recent years with the warming. And there is a little change in the distribution in 2021 from what we've seen um, in previous years. One is, well, like look at the length frequency distribution has actually changed quite a bit. We may be seeing again, one of these kind of cohort tracking where this actually matches up about right, where in about two years time, a cod that's about 20 centimeters will become one that's about between 40 and 50 centimeters. So this is actually the same population moving through. Um, but one of the things that's actually changed, and this may be because the things conditions are a little bit cooler, is that instead of seeing large, large, large catches of cod kind of north of St. Lawrence Island all the way to the Bering Strait, we had some okay catches up there, but the predominance that we're seeing for this region is actually in what we'd consider to be more of the southern half of our northern Bering Sea Survey. So south of um, kind of the southeastern edge of St. Louis Island, and then west from there towards the um, Bering Strait, and kind of right on the, the um, edge of what the dividing line between what we call the eastern Bering Sea Survey and the northern Bering Sea Survey. So when you look at that over the extent of the time series, again, 2010, Pacific cod don't like to go into the cold pool. If you remember that cold pool extended right down through here, looked like a little hockey stick, and the cod were all around the outside edge of that and really effectively not much in the Northern Bering Sea. As warming has happened and the cold pool has broken down, they've spread across the shelf. And at least in 2017 and 2019, there was considerable numbers of Pacific cod north of St. Lawrence Island towards the Bering Strait. Um, this year, Again, there's still a fair number of Pacific cod in the Northern Bering Sea, but the larger um, catches were actually south of St. Lawrence Island. And that plays out down here in those estimates of the total weight, that, those biomass estimates. So in the Northern Bering Sea in 2017, it went up 887% from 2010 levels, went up another 27% in 2019. It dropped almost 40% in 2021, but, Almost the same amount that we lost um, in the Northern Bering Sea is about how much, when you actually count up the metric tons, is what we gained in the south, uh, in the Eastern Bering Sea shelf. And so I think most of what that is, is that there may be a smaller difference in the population, but it's more of a shift of the center to right around the survey edge. So some of these are now being counted here than instead of in the Northern Bering Sea. Walleye pollock, another species that in the colder years, you know, essentially like 2010, were not really a feature of the Northern Bering Sea ecosystem. In fact, all we would really see is a few, we can't really see it here, but very large um, Pacific uh, walleye pollock, and then a really small bump of, um, of young of the year, age one juvenile fish. In 2017, there was a very large number of large, mature walleye pollock in the region and still a lot of juveniles. 
same in 2019. In 2021, a little bit cooler conditions, we saw a similar pattern to what we saw I just described with the Pacific Cod, less pollock in uh, the Northern Bering Sea, but certainly not the same kind of distribution or patterns what we saw in 2010. And again, these areas that were kind of north of St. Lawrence Island that we used to get lots and lots of Pacific Cod, or excuse me, walleye pollock in recent survey years didn't really show up in 2021. And again, same kind of issue as when I described walleye pollock in the colder years, when that cold pool extended down, much of this subarctic population was not wanting to cross that barrier. And we see them out here on the outer edge of the survey near deep water. When it broke down, fish move across the shelf, start showing up in large numbers in the Northern Bering Sea, except for this year. And um, that decline, so we basically dropped 59% between 2019 and 2021 in the Northern Bering Sea, um, which on one hand you would say, well, maybe that's fish moving back down with the slightly cooler water more towards the, um, the Southeastern Bering Sea region that we would expect them to be in. But when you look at our Eastern Bering Sea estimates, we actually dropped 44% down to about 3 million metric tons. Um, this is the third lowest estimate of walleye pollock in the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf in our uh, survey history that goes back to 1982. Saffron cod, so this, uh, or also known in the region uh, as tom cod, uh, this is certainly a species that's near and dear to a lot of hearts, especially those that uh, collect them for subsistence. Uh, this is a hard one for us, and I would not try to read too much into the data for the species. This tends to be a kind of a nearshore species. They um, can be a bit um, uh, brackish. They will get very near shore. Um, their population moves around a lot. They can also be midwater. So our offshore bottom trawl is not the best way to sample for saffron cod. Um, and in fact, it could be that fish were more near shore this year or they were off bottom. This would be an interesting one. I'm going to be very curious to see what Jim Murphy got for saffron cod this year when he talks to you about his surface and midwater work next week. So don't try to read too much into this, but at least between 2019 and 2021 for the Northern Bering Sea, we saw an 80, 88% decline. So this may be a change in the population or it may be just a change in their behavior from what it's been in recent years. So Arctic cod or blue cod in the region, we've talked about these a lot in recent years when I've given these talks because it's been pretty sobering the amount of decline we have seen for Arctic cod or blue cod. This is obviously a kind of Arctic species. This is one of the ones that would use the cold pool as a refuge. So in 2010, when the cold pool extended down, much of that area where it extended down, there was a lot of Arctic cod. So in the Northern Bering Sea, um, and even the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf, we had 37,000 uh, metric tons and 20, almost 23,000 metric tons. When the water warmed up, that number dropped to less than 4,000 metric tons, 90% in 2017, dropped to only 47 metric tons in 2019. But there is a little bit of an interesting and potentially um, uh, bright spot here. Temperatures are slightly cooler this year. Again, not cold, but a little bit cooler and we actually got 83 metric tons. That's a 77% increase from 2019 levels, but still well below what we were seeing in the kind of cold phase of 2010. So this tells me a couple of things. Um, one is, is that cooler temperatures may, and this is just one year data, but may help Arctic cod in the region. The other is, is that um, this also may help us to understand, we've always talked about whether or not this was a mortality associated with the warm water or if these fish are moving, whether where the water is cooler. And this tells me that there may be more movement and they uh, actually are more mobile than we even give them credit for and are able to just kind of move dynamically with the cooler waters in the region. Um, this is another species where Jim Murphy uh, next week can probably give you even more data because a good chunk of this population is off bottom and not available to our bottom trawl. Pacific halibut, you have subsistence halibut fishermen in the area and even some small commercial longline 
uh, fishing. And um, the thing I wanted to point out here most is we're not seeing a big change in the distribution pattern overall. But we actually have seen, um, we actually saw quite a few young, small Pacific cod this year. Um, so between, you know, 40 and 50 centimeters. So, um, you know, that's 15 to 20 inches. These are small fish. These are certainly not ones that, you know, probably even your subsistence fishermen are catching or certainly your longline fishermen. That is to be expected. If you're a, um, you know, a long line or, or a subsistent fisherman in the area and you're concerned about seeing not a lot of really big Pacific cod on this, realize our net is really small. That opening, remember I told you, like it's only about as high as when I stand up and put my arm up in the air. Um, large halibut are able to avoid our gear. So our gear, you know, it, even with the um, halibut commission, they don't depend upon our data for understanding or tracking what's happening with the large halibut in the region or that population. However, as you know, with long line gear, you don't tend to catch the small fish. So this part of the population is actually really important and our data is used a lot for understanding what's going on with small or young halibut. So this is actually a promising um, result for 2021 is this kind of large number of kind of 40 to 50 centimeter fish. And of course that kind of plays out in um, our biomass estimates. Again, it's not a huge increase, only 1% between 2019 and 2021 in the Northern Bering Sea, but we do see 15% increase in the Eastern Bering Sea shelf. Between the cold and warm years, there's not huge changes in, dis uh, in distribution from what we saw in 2010, but um, hopefully those fish that we are seeing, those small fish uh, is gonna amount to something. For the Northern Bering Sea, a region, a species that we've been really tracking for the region, because it's, it's um, maybe very telling as to what's going on with warming is the northern rock sole, a flat fish that lives on the bottom. It's a species that I would refer to as even temperate, you know, so, so not only is it a subarctic species, but they like warmer water, they, their populations extend all the way down into Washington State, Oregon, and into Alaska. So usually the Bering Sea, kind of southeastern Bering Sea is the kind of the extent of their distribution. However, with warming, we went from having very, very few in the Northern Bering Sea in 2010 to having a lot of young fish in the region in 2017. And again, we've seen those fish get bigger, but with a little bit of cooling, it knocked them down. There's much fewer uh, Northern rock sole in 2021. So this may actually be a sign as well that it doesn't take a lot of cooling to maybe try to temper back um, kind of this borealization or northward movement of some of these kind of more temperate or warmer water species. And so you, you can see that play out in these uh, biomass or total weight estimates, you know, so it was growing quite a bit between from 2010 levels to 2019. It dropped 23% uh, in 2021. However, it went up by 6% in uh, the eastern Bering Sea shell. Yellowfin sole, um, this species actually in the Eastern Bering Sea shell makes up um, the largest uh, flatfish fishery in the world. Um, they're not fished um, commercially, and I'm not even sure there's much that goes on with them subsistence wise in the Northern Bering Sea, but there has been concern that this population would start to move north uh, with warming. But we're not really seeing any significant change in the length frequency distribution from even 2010 to current. And when we look at that kind of distributional map, there's some change here as to where the centers of abundance are, but this has more to do with the fish moving from near shore when they spawn in kind of the late winter, early spring to offshore. So with warming happening, where we encounter the population during our survey is moving more than the population of fish moving. And so for the Northern Bering Sea, there was a very small decrease from 2019 levels by 5%. Um, for the Eastern Bering Sea shelf below here, it dropped about 19%. Bering flounder, this is another one of these species of um, concern with the warming trend because this is actually a kind of a more Arctic or cold water loving species. They tend to reside in that area where the cold pool is. And so we saw their numbers um, actually increased between 2010 and 2017. And this is in part because I think most of the fish that were on the shelf 
were moving up into areas in the northern Bering Sea, which, which were still cooler. Now we're starting to see a decline, but with a little bit of um, cooler water in the eastern Bering Sea shelf, they may have dropped down a little bit more to try to take advantage of this habitat. Alaska skate, another subarctic species that's been showing up more, or we were concerned was going to be showing up more in the northern Bering Sea, and that played out in 2017 and 2019. However, a little bit slightly cooler condition, that number dropped down a little bit in 2021 to about 80,000 metric tons. Shorthorn sculpin. Uh, this is an interesting species, and it might actually be more than two species. For those of you that may have heard talks in past years, um, this is one that we also used to refer to as a warty sculpin. However, what we called warty sculpin and what's known as shorthorn sculpin got um, synonymized. Basically, we thought they have been cataloged now as being the same species. Um, I'm not positive yet that that's true, but that's what the best science at the moment says, and that's what we're going with. One of the reasons why I'm not sure that's true is if you look in 2010 in that cold phase, there's this large, large number of really small fish. And when you, if you look at the distribution of where they were caught, that's not what I have plotted over here, but they were very north, kind of all north of St. Lawrence Island. And the shorthorn sculpin is also a species that uh, crosses the Arctic into the Northern Atlantic. And it's a very small species overall, kind of drab in coloration, whereas what we were calling the warty sculpin, which has very similar characteristics and extends down into the eastern Bering Sea shelf and all the way through the northern Bering Sea, is actually a fairly large species and quite colorful. Well, as soon as water temperatures warmed up, we lost this portion of this population altogether. I have a feeling that this more Arctic species that's been synonymized is basically extirpated. It is not something that we're seeing here anymore. This is just my, my hunch. But both species in recent years are not, their numbers are going down a lot. So if you look at the number measured, 3, 000, over 3,000 in 2010, roughly 50% in, in 2017 to 1,400, 335 in 2019, and only 283 in 2021. We also know that these are a food resource for subsistence fishermen in the region. Um, they get called lots of different names, but um, uh, these kind of like large, you know, bullheads or sculpins. This is one of the predominant species in the region. So when we look at those estimates of weight from 2017, and we had a high of 111,000 metric tons in the Northern Bering Sea. In 2019, it dropped to 14,000, and then it dropped almost 50% to 2021 to 7,600 metric tons. Plain sculpin is another large kind of bullhead species. They tend to be a little bit shallower water, softer bottom, what we would call an inner domain species, which means they kind of hug the shoreline here. And you can see that in 2010, 17, 19. And their numbers, they tend to be a bit more of a subarctic species than the shorthorns that we were just talking about. So their numbers were decreasing, but they actually dropped 50% in 2021, um, whether, again, this might be because of the cooling, um, that slight amount of cooling, or maybe something else is going on. Um, but this is a kind of a more subarctic species than the warties uh, slash shorthorns. Purple orange sea star. So getting kind of out of some of the fish data, uh, this is the predominant sea star species throughout the Eastern Bering Sea and into the Northern Bering Sea. And in fact, in other parts of the world, this is considered to be kind of a, um, uh, uh, as I say, nuisance species, but it's uh, uh, an invasive. Uh, they also are kind of referred to at times as being a keystone species. They are very efficient predators on the seafloor communities. They can move into an area like a little pack of wolves and, and eat a lot of bivalves, you know, so they can be that kind of competition for things like walrus food. Um, we were seeing in the um, early years of this warming trend, so 2017 and 2019, consistently larger populations in the northern Bering Sea. So it went up 12 percent between 2010 and 2017. Um, in 2019, it went up another 25 percent. 
This most recent year, it dropped a little bit um, to by 35%, but we're still at levels similar to what we saw in 2010. Um, it's been a little bit more consistent on the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf, but this is definitely a species we wanted to keep track of because, um, because of that kind of keystone effect that I was just talking about. Um, Actually, something new that I learned in the in the last year or so as well, with the help of Gay and talking with a lot of the communities, we found out that these are also um, a subsistence resource, which I found really fascinating. So um, there's certainly plenty of sea stars out there for those that want to harvest them. Uh, sea peaches. This is another one of these species. Um, it's a what we would call a tunicate that we know is a subsistence resource that's valued by some communities in the region. So, and we were asked to add it to this report and um, I, we've tried to do our best on this. And this is one that actually is also very disconcerting because in the Northern Bering Sea region, one of the things that we've seen is a steady decline in the sea peach population. So it went from about 9,000 metric tons in 2010, dropped 19% to 7,000, dropped 73% by 2019 to just under 2,000. And now we're down around 1,400. Um, one of the reasons why beyond uh, uh, reporting this information for uh, providing information to um, subsistence hunters and whatnot in the region is I'm, I'm very curious to hear from people whether or not you're seeing fewer sea peaches on the beach when you guys go out to collect because unlike say the fish and the crabs which have legs and fins and will move when conditions are not favorable uh, these guys are sedentary on the bottom and have to just deal with whatever the condition is at the time um, Lyle, this is Gay. I just wanted to let you know that Orlin Bushu and Gamble's giving you a thumbs up on the decline being seen on the tunicates. Okay, well, well um, I'm hoping that, um, yep. well, and my, my best hope would be is that that means that he's seeing more of them, but I have a bad feeling that he's telling me that I'm right and they've been declining. That's correct. Yeah, hardly any more of them wash up either. Just a oh, very no. few. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention here, Orlin, and Thanks, maybe Orlin. we can talk uh, after this is that because of this concern, uh, I'm working with, um, and actually from uh, discussions with folks in your community, um, there is a graduate student now at Western Washington University that's doing modeling work on trying to actually build a model to look at ecosystem effects, like what will happen with the warming to OPA or or, or um, sea peaches yep. and mm -hmm. she's hoping to come out and actually work with you guys to refine this model because it may actually be a way of tracking food security and determining um, like under which kind of conditions where you might find OPA and what might happen to them. So um, okay. I know we're planning if, if COVID hadn't hit we would be trying to reach out to your communities to work with you on this model. Um, that work started up and COVID kind of kind of messed things up for us but we're going to get back to you. All right, sounds good. But yeah, COVID is, oh man, there's some cases out here and in Sivunga. I was just hearing, I, I'm feeling for your community. So stay, stay. I see you wearing your mask, stay safe. Yep, you too. Um, jellyfishes, uh, to move on. Um, in that same way I was describing the purple orange sea stars as having this kind of ability to structure the ecosystem on the bottom, Jellyfish can have that ability to do that in the midwater. And so it's another group of organisms that we really track. And we also really value uh, input from the communities because you guys see these things wash up on the beaches. You see them when you go out on hunts and you see them during times of the year when we're not there. It helps to validate our observations. So, you know, can, and one of the reasons why we've been really interested in what's going on with them is in for the Northern Bering Sea, in 2010, our estimate for jellyfish from the bottom trawl survey was only around 12,000, a little, almost just, just under 13,000 metric tons. It jumped four, over 400% 400 in 2017 to 66,000 metric tons. It climbed another 34% to 88,000. Um, this year, it dropped down quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to be very keen to hear whether or not you saw less jellyfish um, in this last year and whether this trend is true or not, because um, that'll be really important for us to understand what's going on in the midwater. And again, this is another one of these areas where I'm very, very keen to hear what Jim Murphy has to say next week, because his gear is even more efficient at catching these jellyfish than ours is. 
Pacific herring. I know there's a lot of interest in Pacific herring in the region, not only as a food resource, but because this is one of the forage fishes that feeds a lot of the seabirds and other animals in the region. And so between, in with the warming trend, we were seeing these numbers increase. So be, from 2010 to 17, it went up 52% uh, to around 35,000 metric tons. It climbed again 152% in 2019 uh, to just under 88,000 metric tons, but it declined a little in, uh, in 2021 to around 61,000 metric tons. So while declining 31% sounds like a lot, this is still a, a pretty large number compared to what we've seen historically on the survey in the region. So it, there still seems to be quite a bit of herring, um, actually not only in the Northern Bering Sea, but also in the Eastern Bering Sea shelf, the area to the south of you. Capelin, this is kind of the same story that kind of gives me a little glimmer of hope that we just talked about with the Arctic cod or blue cod, where this is a more Arctic species, um, also a kind of a critical forage fish species for seabirds and, and marine mammals and also larger fishes. Um, but the number dropped uh, from 14,000 in 2010 to almost non-existent to just 179 metric tons in 2017, continued to drop in 2019, but we saw a small, small increase in 2021, which you can kind of see up here in, for the Northern Bering Sea map that makes me think that, again, when temperatures are a tiny bit cooler, these more Arctic species are able to kind of come back. Rainbow smelt, which is a, um, a nearshore fish. Again, this is one that our, our gear doesn't necessarily sample very well, but they're of interest in the region and we try to do our best to track them. And we're seeing numbers in 2021 that are fairly similar to what we saw in 2010. So around 1,800 um, metric tons, but that's a decline from when we got this unusually large population in 2017. So I think this is my last um, kind of species distribution and, and biomass or weight estimate plot. And this is for something called a northern Neptune whelk. Um, this is kind of one of the larger um, uh, snail species in the region. And this is one that we want to track also for a few reasons. One, we found out that people uh, will subsistence harvest these if they are able to. Um, they are kind of um, another prey item, although lesser importance, but for walrus. And just like we were talking about with the opa or sea peaches, they don't move around a lot. So they can be a real indicator of environmental change and what's going on on the bottom. Um, that we are actually able to sample with our trawl. And so one of the things that we saw here was between 2010 and 17, there was a pretty large increase of 61% to 178,000 metric tons. But in recent years in the Northern Bering Sea, they've been steadily declining by kind of around 20% for the last two years. Um, they're also, their populations have been pretty erratic in recent years in the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf. So in 2017, up by 80%, then down by 47%, and then up by 34%. This may be indicative of, you know, kind of an ecosystem in flux as well. Because if you look prior to 2017, kind of historically in our data set, uh, the species wasn't quite this volatile. It tended to be pretty consistent in our catches. But in more recent years, it's, it's become much more um, kind of up and down patterns from one year to the next. So just a few things to kind of go over real quick. And I, I, I'm, these are more like primers for, for talks that I know you're going to get later. And I'm, um, I can't wait to have these people share with the communities the work that they're doing. Um, we are continuing to do um, tagging work on the Pacific Cod to understand how much movement there is with these fish. There was always these questions that are, are all these Pacific cod that we're seeing in the Northern Bering Sea, are these fish resident or do they leave? Are they part of the Eastern Bering Sea population or do they go to Russia? Do they go further north up into uh, like the Southern Chukchi? And using satellite tags, we're starting to get some answers on this. And some of this work has been instrumental um, because of the help we've gotten from like Savunga and the community and the fishermen there uh, to help us get tags on fish. Um, again, we've done a little bit of that work also from our, our survey vessels, but it's, it's been a, um, a great experience and really informative working with the community to do this work as well. 
and it's continuing on. I got the list of the scientists that are involved in this work, and I think Suzanne is uh, planning to try to do another straight science in the near future. Um, has a little bit of a primer for that. I'll mention that um, part of our team put some tags this last winter on cod that were in the Western Gulf of Alaska. By summer, those fish showed up in the Northern Bering Sea and may have gone further north than that. Um, early on when we saw all this cod, I got asked questions about whether these fish could have been from the Gulf of Alaska where we saw a great decline. And at the time I said, no, that's well over a thousand kilometers. There's no way the cod from the Western Gulf showed up in the Northern Bering Sea. I was wrong. We now have tag results showing those fish over the course of a summer will move that far, which is amazing. Well over a thousand kilometers, 1800 kilometers, we're starting to find fish moving in just a few months. It, it's really quite astounding. And I'm, I'm excited to see where this work goes and continues. Another project that I wanna put on everyone's radar is um, we're doing a lot more work looking at fish stress and condition. We're using some new technologies like this device you're seeing being held on a cod here called a fat meter to look at essentially the, the overall body condition of things like the pollock and cod that are showing up in the Northern Bering Sea. Because while these fish are moving, we don't have a good answer as to why. You know, um, if you remember back to the temperature plots, I made the case, you know, talking about how, you know, as the cold pool breaks down, uh, people start to have this idea that fish are moving north because it's cooler. That's not true. If you look at those plots, particularly in the summer, the northern Bering Sea, because it's shallower and because of the Alaska coastal current, the water up there is not colder in the summer than it is in the southeastern Bering Sea. It's actually warmer. So these fish are not moving north into that region because that water is cooler. So this raises a lot of questions about whether or not there's food resource issues or some sort of other condition, or if they're doing it for some sort of interrupted spawning migration. There's a number of reasons that it could be, but one of the big questions becomes, does this have something to do with the overall stress or condition of the fish? Are they seeking out food resources? And the work that Bianca and Jerry and Rebecca are doing will help us to get a handle on that. And I know that they're looking forward to as they collect data, uh, start to assemble their data to present this to you. And potentially to have people participate in it. This, we, the, the value of this work goes up greatly the more we can get samples. The other one I wanted to put on your radar um, to wait for results is working with Gay Sheffield and Kathy LaFay. We collected this last summer um, bivalves all over the uh, southeastern Bering Sea survey region and throughout the northern Bering Sea. We actually gave, put a lot of effort into this this last year and we collected a lot of samples and hopefully you guys will hear uh, the results of that um, in the near future. Um, I think this was our most successful year for getting uh, bivalves for Gay and Kathy to work up to give you guys a better sense of harmful algal blooms throughout the Bering Sea. And with that, um, if you are not tired of hearing my voice, I'm happy to try to take questions. Oh, thank you very much, Lyle. Uh, I'm happy Great. to give you the information, Marlon. So first off, thank you very much, Lyle. That was a lot to think on. There's a lot of um, good information there and we very much appreciate it. For those of you who are maybe new to the Bering Strait region, because we have a lot of people on, know that first thing we do is we give a lot of love to the speaker because it is not easy to prepare such a big presentation and deliver it. It is often hard. So feel free to add in the chat any, um, any good, give Lyle some love there. The second is callers get priority in the Bering Strait region. And we do have several callers. It is very difficult to be a caller in the, Bering Strait region. For some reason, I'm looking at myself and I don't understand why. <laughs> Is that you, Lyle, moving me around? Uh, whoop, whoop. Yeah. Now Sorry. me. Well, how are you doing that, Orlin? All right. Anyway. I was so, doing that. I don't know. Okay. So anyway, um, we have several callers on the line and uh, let's hear it from the callers. If any of our callers have questions, because again, in the Bering Strait region, we often don't have the internet connection. 
So people are actually sitting through watching, flipping paper copies of this presentation that Lyle was kind enough to send out earlier. Um, any of our callers, now's your time to ask a question or say your piece. Okay, sounds like sounds like that is um, a nice and quiet uh, bit from the uh, callers. Oh, Hook. Go ahead, caller. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. Uh, hi, hi, Lyle. Uh, good to hear you again. This is Opic and Dimey. Um, How are you doing, so Opic? I don't have I don't have your slide presentation. Um, it, it didn't download for me, but um, so I'm wondering with your blue king, your blue king crab survey, um, what months were you trawling for them to to get the estimates? So we were in around Diomede, so kind of in your backyard in early August. So like the first few days of August is when the boats were there. And and I forget the number. I forget the estimates on the the blue king crab that you had for. Let me uh, let me zoom to that slide. It's, after I go through all these, they start to blend together a little bit in my own mind. Sorry. And Lyle, know that that okay. the slides. Opic's got the slides, but they just haven't been able to download. And so for the caller, for the people that are outside of the region, know that a four megabyte file takes a long time to open here. It's like old time. So um, so thanks for voicing up, Opic, and thank you, Lyle, for being able to talk our, your way through this Blue King Crab slide, which is now up. Yeah. So um, so I'm looking at the numbers again, Opic. The, the thing I can tell you here is that we saw in 2010, so our cold year, our estimate for the entire Northern Bering Sea was about 2,000 metric tons, 2,025. It went up a lot in uh, 2017 to 5,928. Uh, 5, um, that's a 193% increase. However, that most of that is because we had one large catch. So the uncertainty in this estimate because it all mostly came from one catch and that catch was kind of north of Savunga. Um, so it was kind of down near St. Lawrence Island. So not near you. Um, in 2019, the numbers dropped to lower than what we saw in 2010, dropped 79% down to about 1,228 metric tons. And in 2021, the numbers are similar to what we saw in 2019. So now it's 1,083, so a 12% decline, um, a smaller decline. So I'd say it's been since 2019, between 2019 and 2021, it's been consistent, but at a pretty low level. So pretty hey, low. Wendy. Estimate. <laughs> Zoom yep. meeting. And, oh, and sorry. That those were in the month of August. That that's you were, all from the month of August. And in, in fact, uh, we're probably in that same region within a day or two each time. Okay. And then you you do know that the the king crabs they're they're way offshore in the summer season, right? Yeah, and, and, and I'll be honest, at least in terms of blue king crab, they tend to like a little bit harder bottom than our net maybe likes. So the one thing I'd say is that our numbers, you know, this would be kind of a species where I would call this an index more than a true estimate of abundance. Um, but our numbers should be consistent from one year to the next. So in other words, trends that we see should be real, but the total estimate is probably more of an index. All right, and there was, Opic, does that answer your question? Yep, I, I look forward to seeing your slides though. Lyle, thank you. All right, thank Not you, Opic. And so, don't hesitate to reach out if you need uh, anything else after you get to see them, Opic. I'm happy to talk to you anytime. Awesome, thank you. Any of the other callers have any questions? All right, so 
two things I wanted to mention in the um, a, as you were presenting, Lyle, there was two questions. One was from Orlin and Gamble, who was asking about the clams. And I don't know, Orlin, if you can um, voice up your question with more detail, because I wasn't sure exactly what you were asking. But I saw your uh, chat and there's been a lot of it's been there's been a lot of niceties for Lyle in the chat box and it got a little bit buried. Do you have a question about the clams you would like to ask Lyle? Um, no, just uh, do they have that, uh, uh, that toxin like the mussels, I wonder? So I can grab that one, Lyle. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming this is a harmful algal bloom question, in which case yes. you're the expert and not me. I'm not the expert, but but because Lyle is collecting clams, and it's a huge, it is a huge question, Orlin. How are the clams? We know that there are some that in between Diomede and St. Lawrence Island have been found higher than uh, at a level with the saxitoxin, the biotoxin Yikes. that have been higher than what you'd want to eat, and so um, that's kind of new information, and and so there's a lot of questions about that. Lyle and his group on the boat are they do collect clams, and they are sending those out. So there will be information about those probably in well a little a little while. I know we have a harmful algal bloom, or we have Kathy Lafay scheduled for Straight Science in February. So we will be hearing some about that. We'll make sure you know. Okay, sounds good and. Uh... If you guys do find a lot of that toxin, can you send me uh, something I could hey put a post up in the public areas? Because you bet they, there'll be love, more information. We love clam, and I'm scared that they might poison and die or something. It is a uh, um, we did have that fatality down in Unalaska this year, so it is on everybody's mind. So you bet there'll be a lot of information. I do see Frank Kelty. You okay. had your hand up for a long time. Does that answer your question, Orlin? Yep, it does. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I just one comment before we get to Frank Kelty, and that was in the chat. Wes Jones from Uliquit wanted to note that the jellyfish um, in Eastern Norton Sound follow your slides. The trend. Okay. Wow. Great. Thanks, Wes. All right, Frank Kelty, patient man. <laughs> well, you don't know me that well then. <laughs> this, one of my weak points is not being very patient. But, oh, well, you be, you've been patient so far. Well done. Yes, thank you. Uh, right. Lyle, great presentation. It's nice to see you again. Uh, I had a question. I don't know if I was asleep at the switch, uh, but could you put the last page up for distribution and, and abundance for uh, uh, Opelio snow crab? CFA. I missed that, and I also didn't see one for canner crab, regular a Baird eye, if there was one. So, so for realize that for Baird eye, this talk is mainly focused on the uh, the northern Bering Sea, and we okay. don't have there's basically no Tanner or Baird eye in the northern Bering Sea, so there isn't a slide in this talk. Oh, okay. Um, but you had so snow that, crab, right? Yes, I do. And let me just. And then my here. last question after I see that, I'm going to take a picture of this one. Um, that's why I wanted to get it. But uh, where would I get the uh, presentation online? Uh, that's well. That's a I good didn't question. see it. I didn't see a link on the flyer for the meeting. So there, there isn't a link because there isn't a link yet to to get it. This presentation that's being recorded will be on YouTube along with all the other straight science presentations for the last two years. On the if you Google YouTube and go to the Alaska um, Fishery Sea Grant Science Center. Nope. The Alaska Sea Grant Straight Science. Alaska Google Straight YouTube or just Straight Google Science. YouTube Lyle Britt. Who knows what you'll get? Um, so I guess I have. I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. Um, if you Lyle, did, you are not a patient man. I see that, and that's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm not either. So so um, know that UAF Northwest Campus has a Straight Science webpage, and there'll be a link on that as soon as we get it on YouTube as well. Thank you so much. They, Go ahead with your other question. The last, the last uh, question was, I was curious what, what you saw in some of the cod stomachs you opened up. If you saw, uh, besides fish, if you saw any quantity of uh, small crab. 
So, uh, well, what I can tell you there is in terms of the quantifying the uh, cod stomachs, that work is ongoing. You know, we, you know, with, with when the survey ended essentially at the end of August, and then it takes a little while to get the samples down, they're still working on that. However, people do kind of check a little when they're out on the boat. And this is not new to just this most recent year, but um, uh, uh, the Pacific cod, particularly the ones in the Northern Bering Sea, eat a lot of small snow crab. And so I have pictures from on the deck of the boat of stomachs being opened up that had, you know, basically just large masses of snow crab in them. Okay, well, that's important, you know, we're, we're missing over a, a couple of billion animals uh, on snow crab there yeah, in the other part of the, so that's why I asked the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, no problem. For your, Thank you, Frank. Your answers in the presentation was very informative. He's right. Thank you, Frank Kelty. Very much appreciated. I'm going to take Chad. So he's got his hand up, and then we'll go to the chat because there's a lot of questions in there too. Lyle, are you okay? And the audience, I know we're over, but we, I know I don't want you to stop. I want to make sure we take our time on this. If you're up for that, Lyle. Yep. Yep. No problem. Happy to answer as many as I can. Brilliant. As long as I okay. continue to have power. Great. It's for a little window, <laughs> Same here. So. Yeah, if the power goes out, you just keep going. Um, Chad C., go ahead. Thanks, Gay, and thanks for, for hosting this and, and great presentation, Lyle. Um, I just had a couple of questions on COD, um, my guess, um, that I just wanted to get some clarification on. I appreciated those numbers on, on biomass uh, those uh, that you put up there. I'm just wondering if you saw a similar trend on abundance for the cod stocks as well in the northern Bering Sea and, and eastern Bering Sea, and uh, and if you've seen any, if you saw any evidence of of any new recruitment um, that might be of, of particular note uh, for that stock as well. Uh, so, it's curious about those two points. Yeah, give me a second here, and I can run to the cod slide. So the, the, the thing I'd say here um, in terms of recruitment, in, and again, this, this, this data that you're seeing right here is only for the, um, the Northern Bering Sea, okay? Yeah. So it's not the Southeastern Bering Sea, but um, there is some young fish here that we saw in 2021 that we've not seen up in that region um, in the previous years. Um, and so when we start talking about, you know, I was talking about all the movement, you know, you know, cod are swimming a lot further than we gave them credit for before. That's obviously not these fish. So there is some recruitment that's happening at least somewhere nearby the Northern Bering Sea. Um, I got to temper that though, because again, bottom trawl, very uh, low opening net. It is not an efficient piece of gear for these little cod. Uh, they are midwater at this size overall. So they're kind of outside of the range. We're probably catching these as the net goes up and down you know, as we head down to get put it on the bottom or retrieve it. Uh, and also this is kind of a size that can go through the meshes. So um, in terms of kind of like try, trying to track recruitment, this is another one of these kind of probably plugs for uh, tuning into Jim Murphy's talk and see if he actually caught any cod in the Northern Bering Sea uh, this summer. And that might give you a better idea. In terms of the overall population. I didn't really pull those numbers up in a, in a true form for this talk, but I have that information and um, we're putting it together and it will be in the talk that we'll give um, at the Groundfish Plan Team meeting in two weeks. Got it. Thanks, Lyle. But I don't remember off the top of my head there being any grand changes in it, if that helps. So you'd say it would be fairly similar um, in trends then is the biomass trends. I, for... I think I, the, from, the, from the abundance estimates, I think, uh, yeah, it's gonna be roughly similar to what we've been seeing in a trend. Um, although in 2019, we saw a bunch of young fish that we didn't necessarily see this year, but they were a little bit older. So we're, we're seeing that population move through, but we didn't see a new, as big of a new recruitment class as what we saw in 2019. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Chad C., for your question. Austin, I see you there, and then I'll get to the chat. So thank you for your patience, everybody, with the chat questions. But Austin's got his hand raised, and he's right here in Nome. Go for it, Austin. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you uh, gave a lot of kudos to Bering Strait communities. Um, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that all the 20 communities, 16, 16 communities, 20 tribes in this region are, are, are so keen to help with observations, you know, giving you data, you know, doing a lot of work for you, uh, because the North Pacific Fishery Management Council is, a set, is, is destroying the Bering Sea ecosystem, and that's what we're dealing with now. Um, so I have a concern there, and I'm, I'm wondering how you might be able to improve that trust. And then um, in the beginning of your presentation, you made some characterizations about subsistence. Uh, not all subsistence resource populations or subsistence food components related to subsistence are reviewed or evaluated by your work. And so there needs to be some treatment of that. Um, as you noted, we have a better understanding of how changing fish stocks and species and climate change affect our subsistence lifestyle. Um, and so the characterization that you made at the beginning needs to be revised uh, in terms of subsistence uh, because there's a much uh, there's a much wider array of subsistence resources that we take that we utilize. Are you going to Are you going to recharacterize that? I got um, a quick quick question, Austin. For that recharacterization, do you mean like expand on all the species? Because there there is a lot more species, but I think Lyle limited it to what he could present in this time frame. Is that is that what you mean? Because I think I there think is Lyle more, can answer the question. Lyle. I yeah, I'll let Lyle question. answer. Yep. So, well, and, and along the same lines of what Gay just said, if that's what you mean, yes, there's there's a whole lot more species that are actually in uh, like the community report that we just finished and, and are going to start distributing out to um, uh, the to the villages. Um, and that does go to the best of our ability um, to all 20 and to uh, Kawarik and um, a number of other entities. We try to get the report to as many people as want it. We will print as many as we need. Um, and this is only probably half of the species that are in that report. There just isn't enough time to cover them all. And then in terms of our total data set, I mean, again, I'm happy to meet with you or others anytime. And if there's other things that we should pull out or try to characterize that are um, things that are of a food security uh, concern or a subsistence uh, concern that we can provide information on, we're happy to do that. It, it's actually kind of not a problem, um, other than the fact that if we make the reports really big, then nobody reads them because they're really big. So we try to focus it or target it at least a little bit. Um, as far as your, 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 your comments and concerns about the, uh, the council, I, I, I respect that. I, I, I sympathize with that. But I'm in a, a spot in the sense that uh, um, I'm part of the research arm of, of NOAA. I'm not really on the policy side. So all I do and my group does is, is try to inform. We want to try to uh, uh, monitor the ecosystem. We want to try to provide information and make it freely available to everyone so that everyone can make informed decisions. Um, but my group doesn't actually influence policy. Does that help, Austin? Well, you know, just the point of you know, uh, you know, uh, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council tends to confuse understanding with information, and that's a big problem. We in the region have understanding. We know what this means. The council is destroying the Bering Sea ecosystem, and you know, unfortunately, information doesn't inform understanding. But again, I, I mean, I, 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 res I respect your situation and in any way that we can provide you from the data that we collect information that will help you out um, uh, to increase understanding where ha I'm happy to try to work with you. So um, Lyle, you had sent like right before this presentation, uh, the straight science, the community briefing, that is something I can, I can try to dump in the chat box. Is that, that's, should I be doing? Can it, I it's, try uh, to, we, I don't know if uh, I can. It's kind of like the, the, the hot off the presses thing. Um, yeah. And we literally, you know, this is where we are with getting this data out. We're trying to get it out to everyone. That was finished like at noon today. So yeah, it's I, very new. I just got um, it. You're, uh, I'm happy for you to distribute it. The one thing I would say is that this is not 
this is an informative document. It's not really viewed as a scientific by uh, uh, um, citable publication. So use it for information. If you need something to cite for scientific purposes, reach out to myself or our team and we'll help you out with that because those are coming. This is just preliminary data trying to get it out as quick as we can. And we appreciate that. I just stuck it in there. So if you should be, if you're an audience member, you should be able to um, download that file, click on that. Um, and let me, uh, Dean, can you, can I, I just want to get to some of these um, questions in the chat box rolling and we'll come right back to you. So thank you for your patience. So from Charlie, there are Russian trawlers seeming to fish in the Chukchi. That is something we have seen this summer. Are they chasing Pollock? That's the question. So, uh, I mean, I've gotten a number of reports, but I, I can't actually say definitively what they're doing. Um, but from the reports that I've heard from a number of people, there's one or two um, factory taller size vessels that have been going up into the southern Chukchi. Seems like the most likely thing they would be doing is fishing Pollock. But we don't see those reports. Um, it's not like they um, advertise that to us. So I, I don't have an official way of knowing what they're doing, but that seems to me to be the most likely. There was also one of the last times I looked, uh, nine long line vessels up there. Those are probably fishing cod. Again, I say probably because I, I don't actually know for sure, but that'd be my guess on those. All right, thank you. From Rob Kaler at the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, wow, my mind is blown. I think a lot of minds are blown tonight. Do you look at the stomachs? What are they consuming? I think this is for cod. How many forage fish per day do you think a cod, Pacific cod, I would assume Rob, Pacific cod consumes? Or do you mean Arctic cod? Pacific. Pacific cod. Thank you, Rob. So, um... To be honest, Rob, uh, if you have that interest in this, I can get you in touch with our, our Trophics lab that does that work and they can probably fill you in on it. I mean, I, I have not looked to see what the kind of the uh, uh, um, kind of evacuation rates are and whatnot, you know, and I know it's very temperature dependent, um, but they'll have a better idea of that. In terms of how much they can eat, it certainly depends upon the size of the cod, but, you know, I, I've certainly opened up cod they're in that 70 to 80 centimeter size and taken out a mass of snow crab small snow crab that was about the size of like a large cantaloupe so probably 30 crab or more so like I don't know how many capelin can you shove into a cantaloupe that's probably what they could eat yeah thank you I uh, we hear that uh, a mer for example can eat anywhere between uh you know 90 to 300 forage fish in a day uh, just to keep up their metabolism. So I was curious how much a cod, a Pacific cod or a, um, yeah. Anyways, thank you very much. Um, from La Jared and Melvin, and I believe that's on St. Lawrence Island. Thanks for the slide. It's great. Did the trailer catch any chum, sockeye or king fish? I assume salmon. Okay, so I'm assuming he's asking like, so the trawlers are vessels. Did we catch any salmon? So. Again, given the small size of our net, we also tow it only three knots, so very, very slow. Um, so we tend to not catch salmon. It's pretty rare. I think out of our 144 stations that we towed in the Northern Bering Sea, we caught three salmon. And I don't remember the species off the top of my head, but there, it's, a, it's pretty rare for us. And actually that was notable that we caught three. So Jared and Melvin know that um, next week, the surface trawl survey fellow, Jim Murphy from NOAA in Juneau, he will be talking about specifically about king, pinks and chum, salmon. So he will have more information. So your, hopefully your question will on, on the fish um, around St. Lawrence Island will be uh, really something he can talk to in detail, but it doesn't sound like Law got but three. Um, and then one, we'll go with a question here from the chat and then we'll try to find Dean. Um, this is from Marilyn. For walleye pollock, the lengths that you measured were all about 50 centimeters. 
Is that an artifact of sampling gear or are there biological factors that eliminate the smaller and larger fish? Seems odd that across years, the length distribution is stuck at 50 centimeters, around 50 this centimeters. Is, this is a really great question. And uh, this is a, a, a someone who's very astute. So uh, I thank you for it. It's a good thing to point out. The reason why you see this um, kind of lull in the data most years. In fact, in 2019, it was unusual that we caught as few of these, uh, the few that we did of walleye pollock that are between kind of 20 and 35 centimeters. That's age two and age three walleye pollock that fit into that size category. And those are pelagic at that stage. They don't really associate near the bottom much or very rarely. So effectively, our bottom trawl does not see this part of the population. So um, again, you know, kind of throwing it onto Jim next week, the midwater trawl, you'll probably see a pattern where he has less big fish and you're gonna see a whole lot more in this size category from that midwater and surface trawl work for walleye pollock. Um, pollock for the juveniles, like these age zero, age one fish that are down here, um, it, it's really fascinating. The, the juvenile fish seem to split 50-50 between being in the midwater and being near the bottom. So we always get some age ones and then kind of almost nothing and then the larger mature fish. All right, Dean, are you, are you still on? I'm still hanging in. All right, go for it. First of all, great presentation, Lyle, really enjoyed it. Um, you collected bivalves for HABs analysis. What about forage fish, capelin, saffron cod, herring, sand dabs, anything? Did you save some of those for analysis? So we got the request for some of those from Gay a little late in the survey and we tried to collect what we could. But again, if you looked at those slides when I went by them, I mean, we're not a good, our, our, our survey is not a good method, even in really good years, typically for getting some of those forage fish species. Um, the one that we got was some herring and uh, oddly enough, by the time we got word that asking for some of the forage fishes for this collection as well, we, we kind of got out of the herring, we weren't seeing them anymore. Um, and that was one of the few that we got any real numbers of. Yep, sounds good, thanks. All right, how you doing, Lyle? Holding up? Doing good. All these questions. Okay, so um, from Yareth Rosen, I think she's with Arctic today. Uh, someone asked earlier about Russian fishing in the Chukchi. She's interested as well. Do you have much info about what's going on there in the fish stocks and the harvests? I think you'd answered that, but I, that's the question. I, well, I mean, I guess the part of that that we haven't answered, or, and I honestly don't have an answer for is, I mean, you know, the, the Russians have done on the, in the Western Chukchi, they've done their own stock assessments and they've released numbers. Um, and they've certainly um, uh, uh, have pretty good biomass estimates for Pollock and Cod in recent years in the Western Chukchi, the Southern Western Chukchi. And they use that to, to uh, set up and justify a fishery. Um, but exactly what their numbers are, that's not something that we necessarily, you know, they don't obviously for good, you know, for good reasons, they're their own sovereign nation. They're not consulting with us on, uh, on population size or the numbers or what they're fishing on. So we hear about it a little bit after the fact and we know it's been going on, but, um, but the bigger point to it is, is that it tells me that, you know, and everyone here is, you know, that there's not a magic gate at the Bering Strait. So when we're seeing large amounts of pollock and cod moving into the northern Bering Sea, and we see large numbers historically right up to the Bering Strait, those, those fish are likely continuing into the, into the southern Chukchi. And the other hint on that is I mentioned earlier that I'm looking forward to uh, Suzanne McDermott, who's been doing our satellite tagging of Pacific cod. We had a tagged cod from the western Gulf that I believe sh uh, the tag popped up north of the Bering Strait. So that fish popped up in the Southern Chukchi. That's interesting. <laughs> um, hope that answers the question. All right, um, Franz Muter asks, thanks, great talk. Besides snow crab, can you comment on how predation from the large number of Pacific cod in the Northern Bering Sea during the warm years may have impacted the abundance of other prey species that you track in your survey? 
So it would have impacted other prey species. Uh, well, I mean, this is something that's an area uh, uh, of research that's not mine. And, but lots of questions in this area are coming up. So maybe I'll talk with Gay and we can see about getting somebody from our tropics lab to give us straight science. They're, they're the group that actually looks at these dynamics and is looking at what the cod are eating and how it's changed over time and in the region. So um, my group is more doing the numbers. I can give you some kind of like generalistic tendencies, but um, I think we're starting to get enough of these questions, Gay, that we should see if we can get somebody from our tropics lab to actually talk about these linkages. I can work That'd with be great. you. So I guess I'm delaying an answer for you on that one. We'll, let's get you someone that can give you a really good answer. We'd, we'd love it in the region to get a good answer. Thank you so much, Lyle. That's really nice. Um, Sean Rohan sort of gives a shout out to Yareth to answer her question. In, ca in case it's of interest, global fishing watch data suggests Russian factory trawlers were operating in the Chukchi from mid-August through mid-October. So, um, Rafaela asks, did you catch any novel fish species? Good question. Mm, I'm trying to think of what we caught that was novel this year. It's a little tricky for me because I've been doing this for a long time. So you start trying to think of what's novel to others when you've been, I've been doing these surveys since 1995. So I'm trying to think of what's novel. Um, Did you catch a great white shark? That's what I'm waiting for. Seriously, yeah, with the arrival of the sea lions and the numbers that we're seeing, that they're first cousin to salmon sharks. You didn't get we, one of those, we, did you? No, we did not. Um, I remember we in 2019, we got Aka mackerel and actually a fair number of them in the northern Bering Sea, which was surprising, but that didn't happen this year. Um, I am trying to think of anything that I would... Dwayne's helping you out. He just answered Raffaella saying, nothing that I'm aware of that we haven't seen over the past few years. And Good question, kind of my feeling, but, You know, when you're not on every leg and every toe and whatnot, sometimes I was trying Thanks, to think, I'm not thinking of anything. Um, and Rob Kaler with Fish and Wildlife has a, another question. Where are the Pacific cod and pollock breeding? Um, but well, there's a lot of work going on on this and we're wondering if it's actually changing. Um, but historically, like if you look at Pacific cod, their um, spawning areas are, um, well, a lot of them are spawning along the um, actual um, shelf to kind of slope break. So kind of along through this area. Um, and, and for at least in the Bering Sea, that's kind of the kind of the primary areas along this kind of slope break. Um, walleye pollock, we know, uh, well, there's groups that do a lot more work on this than I do, but uh, they actually go and grow a summer uh, migration and tend to head up and spawn a lot up more in this region here, kind of like right around the U.S.-Russian border. And in fact, we have some reason to believe that how some of these fish are ending up in the northern Bering Sea, uh, oddly enough, has less to do with uh, the breakdown of the cold pool, um, putting them in there, but more about them um, moving east because they move up in their spawning migration and they get pushed east as the ice comes down. And Rob says, thanks, Lyle. All right, if there's, I know we still have someone attending on the phone. So if you have a, we'll leave this a quiet period here for the caller. If the caller has any um, questions, again, it's really hard to be a caller on a Zoom call because you can't raise your hand or show your face or wave your arms. So uh, go ahead, caller. It, Feel free to voice up if you want to, if you have a question. So Lyle, I, if there's any other questions, any other questions from the Zoom audience? I have a question. I'm waiting patiently. Oh, you're gonna so, give me a zinger, I know it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not. I hope not. Um, so number one, I love the slides. By the way, that full map of the whole Bering Sea as opposed to chunking it in northern, southern, it's really great. Um, and your whole presentation was awesome. So 
Here's now, you my question. Think, I, everyone need to thank my team. Like people, I, I, I thank can't team. express how much everyone put into getting this done and how quickly they pulled it off. It, it's really it looks, quite a feat. It looks, it's really easy to uh, interpret. So thank you so much for my, from me and my interpretation skills. They're, they're good ones. Um, so across the board for, for if you're sitting here in the, in the Bering Strait region, we've seen that the ice is, you know, like the dominoes, right? The ice is not so strong. The water's not so cold. The fish seem to be on the move. Industry's coming and all that that brings. Overall, looking at all these declines and things like that, not all, not everything's declining and that's good to know. Is, is there the thought that there's like an overall loss of carrying capacity in the, in the, I don't even know whether to say in the Northern Bering Sea or the Southern Bering Sea, or is it, is it because it looks like from, from here, how could everything kind of go down so quickly? Is it that there's something we're not as rich as we were in uh, primary like production? I hear, let's see if I can, I, I can tackle this one. I mean, the main, okay. my, this again, my kind of personal answer on this would be is that um, uh, I don't think we have enough information on that. But Fair I enough. also, from my scientist, my science bent, I would also say that I get a little hesitant when I hear words like uh, um, ecosystem collapse or something like that get thrown around. And uh, and I'm not saying that people are doing anything wrong when they say that, but more the the effect that you know if you have a chemical pollutant you can truly have an ecosystem collapse in an area, right? So, you know, toxin enters an area, oil spill, something like this, it can have a fundamental effect. What we're seeing now in my mind is this is an ecosystem that's very much in flux um, and it's getting very stochastic in the region. And so, like you just mentioned, we have very rapid change in distribution. We're also probably having very rapid change in kind of quote unquote winners and losers on a kind of a regional scale. Um, but that stuff becomes really hard to add up. Um, Mother nature and kind of the ecosystem is really quote, uh, quick to go to an equilibrium in terms of like energy flux. Um, but it isn't always the same as it was before. And that takes also some time. So when we're seeing so much change, so much movement, so much going on, I, I think it's really hard to do that kind of calculation of saying like, have we lost a carrying capacity? I, I think we need to get, sadly, hear this all the time from scientists, but we need a little more data. Right. Well, no, I appreciate that answer a lot because, you know, I, I'd like to know how much ice algae was lost, how much that impacts the zooplankton. You know, for, for our region, it, it, everything was kind of ice centric. And, um, and now we don't we see such a, like you say, it's very, the swings are big and we see these things happening, unfolding here at a very fast rate. So, so thank you for your answer. I, I guess we do need to, the jury's out on that. We need more information, but just a thought from up here. It looks like there's a lot of hungry going on up here anyway, in the Northern Bering Sea, a whole lot of hungry in our animals, our sea animals. Um, we're we're, we're so definitely in, uh, seeing a, an, a, a large, a very large marine ecosystem that's undergoing very dynamic flux from one year to the next. There's no doubt about that. All right. So thank you for that. Any other questions? I do want to thank everyone for giving Lyle some love in the chat box. Um, oh, and actually, Dwayne, thank you. I see your chat where you say, you say, I think more of a latitudinal shift, which may reverse in the future. A latitudinal, right? Okay. Thank you. With that, thank you, everybody, for sticking with it. This was a, a longer straight science, but a really interesting one. And tune in next week. If you want a notice for the, uh, because I, I see some names that are maybe not familiar to me at all, but if you want to get a flyer, an invitation, the Zoom link for Jim Murphy's talk, please leave your, if you can, leave your um, email address in the chat box and we'll make sure you get that. We'll be advertising that pretty soon. Um, and also a shout out to to Kuliak going north and to Seth Danielson and Jackie Grebmeyer who will be leading that effort and for them to turn around 
as quickly as um, can possibly be done. And that's a huge effort to do that. And they're only going out for 10 days. Lyle was out for uh, three months. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> and um, so that we'll be able to get a little peek at what's going on in the Chuck GC um, after Jim Murphy next week. Austin, do you have your hand up again? Or um, a lot of my screen is moving around. So do you still have a I, I do, I do. Okay. Uh, I, just want, I just want to point out that there, are, there are chemical stressors in this ecosystem in peril. And that's, of course, acidification. The IPCC has unequivocally said acidification, uh, a pH has decreased, right? And that's from carbon. The other one is uh, gray water, black water discharge, as well as oily waste discharge from all of the traffic. And uh, not, not to mention the greater than, uh, you know, 20,000 gallons of oil and hazardous substance that is spilled every single year in Northwest Arctic. So I mean, on top of climate change, there are chemical influences, which is causing this ecosystem. But, but I, I, the, the question I had though, uh, related to, um, um, uh, we had years of movement north during warm weather. And then we had a slight change to cold. Did the slight change to cold kill fish or did it cause them to move? And do you have any opinion on, on what that means for the uh, you know the supposed uh, notion that industry need uh, industry wants to move north, and 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 is that a, is that is that something that we should even allow? So um, that's a really complex question. A lot to unpack there, uh, Austin. Um, Again, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not on the policy side, um, but in terms of, uh, I wanna make sure I didn't mischaracterize this, but you know, things were a little cooler in 2021, but I would not consider it a, a quote unquote cold year. Um, it's still very much on the warm side. It's just a little cooler than what we've seen in the very most recent years. Um, so a lot of the trends that I think I'm seeing and overall in the populations is, is more towards the warm side kinds of trends. Um, it was slightly better for things like Arctic cod, but by, but a pretty minuscule amount. Um, in terms of, you know, does that that kind of large scale rapid from one year to the next warming and cooling, is that causing fish to move or also causing mortality? It's probably yes on both cases. And you start getting into a species level for us to kind of figure out which it is and, and actually where they are in the region and how far they moved. So it, yeah, it, it, it's a really complex one to, to pull that all apart. Thank you, Austin. And I'd like to say that all that, that Austin was saying about, about the, the oil going in the water, that's on our side. You know, what's going on on the Russian side, that's a whole nother, um, that's a whole nother gamble of, what's happening. We have had in this region, just in case people are unaware, we have had in this region um, heavily oiled marine mammals harvested and seabirds harvested and or wash up. And it's not from any oil spill on our side. We've also had biogenic oil fouling. So, so thank you, Austin. There is a lot going on in the Bering Strait region. And what we know is what's happening on our side. We get a glimmer once in a while of what's happening on the Russian side. So thank you for bringing that up as far as chemicals and whatnot in the water. Um, okay, with that, any other questions? You got a great presentation. Thanks, Lyle, from Austin. Thank you, Austin. And, and thanks back, Austin. I mean, you always ask challenging questions, but I appreciate that. So anytime. Um, and just a shout out again, next week we have Jim Murphy. So we'll see you all then. Awesome job.